Destroying obstacles that challenge our effectiveness. 11, 27, 17. Start off with Galatians 5, 16 through 6, 1. But I say, walk and live habitually in the Holy Spirit, responsive to and controlled and guided by the Spirit. Then you will certainly not gratify the cravings and desires of the flesh of human nature without God. Well, it can't be made any clearer than that. I love that walk and live in Holy Spirit by habit. When we are born again and filled with Holy Spirit, we are equipped to be opposition to the enemy. We live in this world but when we are made alive, we are no longer of this world. We are in a hostile environment, so it's going to take effort to walk out the truth. It's easy to create bad habits. Basically, all you have to do is just sit there, and bad habits will seem to find a way to lock on to you. The flesh is the human nature without God. Our spirit is made alive to Father, but the flesh needs to be changed by what our mind is exposed to. Our soul is our mind, will, and emotion. These are exposed to the world, but we cannot allow them to be trained by the world. The realm of the soul must be trained by our spirit that is filled with truth from Holy Spirit. It's unfortunate that we do not live in a Garden of Eden atmosphere. Where we live is no longer perfect. However, Jesus died to enable us to receive life in our spirit, to enable us to be filled with Holy Spirit, to enable us to receive the atmosphere of heaven into our spirit. The difference is going to take work. We know how bad habits work and now we must establish a good habit that has the ability to overcome the bad habits. The habit that we must establish is our consistency in pressing in to receive from Holy Spirit. If we're going to live in kingdom effectiveness, that effectiveness needs to be established in our spirit and our mind must be trained to think in line with the truth that Holy Spirit reveals. We must be responsive to and controlled and guided by Holy Spirit. That is going to take effort because you're going against the grain of the world. Now, whenever I lose my desire for Father, it reveals that I have been feeding on things of the world instead of, by habit, pressing in to receive from Holy Spirit and to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus. I continually have people come to me and ask me for help because they feel they have lost the fire for God that they once had. And I will continually have people ask me if I think they have actually lost salvation. My answer for both goes back to this. How are you spending the time and with whom are you spending your time? If you feel like you're gratifying the cravings and desires of the flesh, then most likely you've not been living and walking habitually in Holy Spirit. There's no great mystery to it. If you walk in the flesh, you're going to be mindful of the things of the flesh. If your mind is full of things in the flesh, I can tell you by experience that you will be engaging in activities of the flesh. The realm of the spirit is born again and filled with Holy Spirit. The realm of the soul must be protected constantly. The realm of the soul is somewhat like a child. If you let a little child alone for too long, the little child is going to get into trouble. It shouldn't be a big surprise. So why are we surprised when we end up walking in the flesh when we have allowed the realm of the soul to be out there alone in the world, alone to where we have put our mind, our will, and our emotions up for grabs to the highest bidder. The realm of the soul must be protected. It must be trained by the Spirit so that just like the way a little child is trained and protected. Verse 17, for the desires of the flesh are opposed to the Holy Spirit and the desires of the Spirit are opposed to the flesh, godless human nature. For these are antagonistic to each other. Uh, they continually were standing and in conflict with each other so that you are not free but are prevented from doing what you desire to do. So why does it take to work and walk in the Spirit? What does it take? Because the flesh opposed to the things of the Holy Spirit. The enemy is opposed to Holy Spirit because Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Truth. We walk in truth and power of the Holy Spirit. We are empowered to undo the works of the enemy. In verse 18, but if you are guided, led by the Holy Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Well, in 2 Corinthians 3, 17, the word says that the Spirit of the Lord, there is freedom. There is not only freedom for you, but you also have the ability to bring freedom to all those who are oppressed by the enemy. The way to obtain freedom is to spend time with the Spirit of the Lord. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And where the spirit of the world is, there will be bondage. 
When I become focused on the things in the world without my affections locked on, the, on and in the spirit of the Lord, the world begins to cause me to have affections for that which I focus on. We have to understand that the world is one big huge trap. The demonic realm constantly lays various forms of bait to lure us into this big trap. When I'm led by Holy Spirit, though, I see the bait for what it is, and I turned away. But the bait that leads to the trap, you see, Jesus came to set the captives free. Now we are commissioned to set the captives free. It's very hard to walk out your commission to set the captives free when you are yourself in bondage. Do your best not to play around with those things in the world that have the ability to pull you away from Father. Even though they aren't overly desirable and you think there's no harm in what you're doing, you must realize that the enemy is always setting you up to cause you to fall. When a person is not born again and filled with the Holy Spirit, that person becomes a puppet for the enemy and is tormented by the enemy too. But when a person is born again, the son or daughter or father, the enemy loves to torment them. But in fact, the main objective of the enemy is to pull the supernatural superior being that has to ability to destroy the works of the enemy into compromise and eventually pull into ineffectiveness. It's a little deep, but let's continue on with the scripture. Now 19 says, Now the things, the doings, practicings of the flesh are clear, obvious. They are immorally, immorality, impurity, impure thoughts and stuff, and indecency. How about idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, ill time? Selfishness, divisions, uh, party spirit, fractions, sex with peculiar opinions, heresies, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. I warned you beforehand, just as I did previously, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It's quite a list. Well, we are made in the image and likeness of Father. We are born again and filled with Holy Spirit. We have the ability to overcome, the ability to become one with Father. We cannot become one with Father and at the same time become one with the world. While we are on this earth, we have the amazing privilege to inherit the kingdom of God and to walk out the effectiveness that comes with that privilege. We need the revelation that the things, the activities of walking in the flesh only were able to surface because of the fall of man in the garden. The things of the flesh are in opposition to Father. If we still lived in the atmosphere of the Garden of Eden. The desires of the flesh would not hold the temptation that they do for us now in the realm that we are exposed to. God didn't choose a group of things that we found fun, entertaining, and alluring, and then chose to command us to resist these things to make a tough life for us. No, actually, it's just the opposite. God gives us insight into what works and what does not work. Walking in the flesh is so inferior to walking in the spirit. The things of the flesh opposed the nature of God because the nature of God is life and things of the flesh eventually lead to death. The enemy entices us through deception. The enemy demonically entices us to be attracted to that which has the ability to pull us away from Father. You see, when we are one with Father, we become vessels through which Holy Spirit can minister to set the captives free by undoing the works of the enemy. However, if we are enticed to walk in the flesh, we actually take on the destructive nature of the demonic realm. Believe me, I'm not saying it's easy. Even with all the revelation I have, and many of us have, we still must constantly train and discipline our flesh, just as we would a small child. We constantly need to walk out the revelation that things of the flesh only become enticing when we do not habitually walk and live in the Spirit, in Holy Spirit. Now, wrong desires are fed by thoughts, and that can leave harmful options open. I have found for myself over the years that if I want freedom, I cannot let options just lay out there on the table. If I do not, on purpose, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, well, then I can allow thoughts to be left alone to create opinions that will attract harmful desires. The Word of God is a seed that gets planted in my heart, and the Word of the world of the demonic realm is a seed that gets planted in your soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, and emotion. A thought will be planted in the realm of the soul, and it will grow. It gains momentum, and it steers your emotions. 
other similar thoughts will engage to feed into the main demonic thought. The word of God is planted in your heart. In your heart, your spirit is the real you. The real you who is trained and taught by Holy Spirit must control thoughts that invade your soul because every thought has the ability to become a foothold that develops into a stronghold. When a stronghold is established, the realm of the soul has the ability to make you spiritually ineffective. Let me give you an example. When I have a conflict with someone, I must find that I must clear up that conflict as soon as possible. If I don't get it settled, I leave a thought in my soul, and it becomes hard to control. Even though I'm determined not to think any more about that conflict, I basically find it impossible to maintain. I'm sure a lot of you understand this. My unsettled thoughts will quickly attract thought after thought after thought. My mind gets boggled and thought that flows along the same path in the same pattern. There's a foothold that has become a stronghold, and that's all I can think about. A foothold is the way, is like the way in. It's kind of like the stronghold is the pattern of thoughts that entered the foothold and traveled the same path until I find I cannot break the pattern. Soon, I find myself so consumed by the mess that I do not effectively rely on Holy Spirit to bring truth to settle the issue. The reason is because I have opened the door for the enemy to come in and create unchecked speculation. A speculation is a thought or thoughts that I have allowed to be deemed as truth, even though there is no validation for the basis of that truth. Speculation, as the word implies, causes the thoughts to begin to run rampant because I have created a track for these thoughts to travel on without resistance. In a track meet, Runners run on a track. The track is well marked, free from obstacles, and is heavily traveled. You know, you never see a track meet where people run through a thickly wooded area. There would be stopping and starting, and people would hit roadblocks, and we would fall, and they would fail to reach the finish line. The enemy wants us to allow demonic thoughts to create a track like that in the woods for those thoughts to travel on. The enemy does not want opposition or obstacles of his demonic thoughts, the enemy wants our thoughts to travel the same path and same path over and over again until it's hard to travel anything else differently. Now a demonic stronghold established, a pattern of thinking has been created that is no longer kept in check by the truth. So we are blessed with the presence of Holy Spirit. When I spend all my time in the world, I offer up the realm of my soul to be enticed and trained and controlled by the world that I have allowed demonic strongholds to become established, which makes it impossible to live any other way than to live for the flesh to gratify the flesh. If I do nothing but live to gratify the flesh, I will not inherit the kingdom of God and all the goodness of the kingdom of God because I no longer have access to the kingdom because everything I do causes me to live in opposition to the things of the Father. And verse 22 continues, But the fruit of the Holy Spirit... The work which his presence within accomplishes is love, joy, gladness, peace, patience, even temper, forbearance, kindness, goodness, benevolence, faithfulness, gentleness, which is meekness and humility, self-control, self-restraint, continence. Against these things there is no law that can bring a charge. And those who belong to Christ Jesus the Messiah have crucified the flesh, the godless human nature with its passions and appetites and desires. This scripture is really cool. If I live in Christ Jesus, I will walk in the Spirit, because living in Christ Jesus causes my flesh to be crucified. If I live in the world apart from Christ Jesus, then I will give in to the desires of my flesh, because I am operating by a godless human nature. Verse 25, If we live by the Holy Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. If by the Holy Spirit we have our life in God, let us go forward, walking in line, our conduct controlled by the Spirit. Let us not become vainglorious and self-conceited, competitive and challenging and provoking and irritating to one another, envying and being jealous of one another. Brethren, if any person is overtaken in misconduct or sin of any sort, you who are spiritual, you who are responsive to and controlled by the Spirit, should set him right and restore and reinstate him without any sense of superiority and with all gentleness. 
keeping an attentive eye on yourself, lest you should be tempted also. I want to be free so I can effectively bring freedom to others. I really get frustrated with myself when I do not walk out the kingdom of God in the power and authority that Jesus died to enable me to do. And I don't like it when I allow my affections for things in the world to reduce my effectiveness in walking out the ministry of reconciliation. I am filled with Holy Spirit, and Holy Spirit enables me to have access to truth. Truth is higher than what is even apparent to us. A carnal person speaks about what they experience in the natural. A spirit-filled person speaks from their potential to see what the natural person cannot. We received insights into the ways of Father. We receive revelation. Revelation is truth that is not accessible to the natural realm. When you speak what is revealed to you, you release the kingdom of God into the natural realm. What you can't see is eternal. So when I speak revelation that I've received from the kingdom of God, I provide access to the provisions of God that people in the flesh do not have the ability to see. We need to walk out a life of walking in the Spirit that opens up new options and possibilities for the lost. When I speak words that are received from revelation, I release seeds self-energized words and have the ability to bring a manifestation. That's what I receive when I seek first the kingdom of God. I must discipline myself not to rely in the natural, but to seek the provisions of the kingdom. When Jesus ministered, Jesus provided people with the experience to see what spiritually they are not able to see. The kingdom of God is the spirit of the Lord, which is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit reveals truth among Contamination. For the person who hears the word, options are changed because the kingdom become manifest. And what you receive, when you receive that revelation of the kingdom of God, you release the revelation through the words that you speak. We must be trained to demand to see beyond what is just obvious. When you only see what is seen by the non-spiritual, you are just conforming an inferior reality. Ears to hear blessed you with eyes to see. When you hear what is possible and embrace it, you now can demand to see it as you pull the provisions of the kingdom of God into the natural realm and see those provisions made manifest. You are limited by what you have the ability to see based on what you have the ability to hear. The unseen realm has more substance in the seen realm because the seen realm was a manifestation from the unseen realm. Everything that you can see with your natural eyes is inferior to what you are able to see with your spiritual eyes. Unfortunately, most people live by embracing the inferior. Well, healing is a manifestation of the superior realm. If you limit what you choose to hear, then you will limit what you will have the ability to see. Physical healing is received from the physical realm, and that is inferior to a manifestation from the realm of the kingdom of God. Inferior circumstances have to bow their knee to the name of Jesus. Disease is inferior when you operate in the superior realm. You have to obtain from the superior realm what you want changed in the inferior realm. Whatever you are to able to believe based on revelation of your kingdom of God, you now have to, you have the ability to receive it. And when you give your affections to something in the natural, you become a hostage to an inferior realm. There is not enough separating the born-again, spirit-filled, joint heir with Jesus, Son of God, home of the Father of Jesus, the new creation in Christ Jesus, from people in the world. If someone who is not filled with the Holy Spirit can mimic your walk, then the revelation of the gospel is not alive to you. If someone who is not filled with Holy Spirit can mimic your walk, think about that. There's too much Christianity through association rather than through relationship, and it's just not enough. <clears throat> too many people have become spiritually asleep, and it's not enough. Our commitment to truth is not enough to, in comparison to what is at stake. It doesn't matter what I think. It matters what I know. What I know is obtained by pushing the truth I receive to the results and experience I see. The love that God has for me does not demand me to do anything, but
but the love of God that has found residence in my heart compels me to do everything. Walking by faith takes commitment. It takes work. It takes sacrifice. And hang on very tight for this one. It's going to take your precious time. Without love, our time is fully committed on ourselves. And there is no time for others, at least not without major effort to juggle our agendas along with the heavy guilt trip. No, we've missed it. It's not enough. What we do is not enough. I know our salvation is not by works. I'm not talking about our salvation. I'm talking about being so overtaken by the love of God that sacrifice for the well-being of others becomes my passion. You see, love is not self-seeking. I have been filled with the love of Father. I am moved by his love. His love drives me for the impossible because the love refuses limitation. Love is the most powerful force there is. That love compels me to excel for the sake of others. Love compels me to know the kingdom better than I am acquainted with my life on this earth. Love drives me to walk out Jesus before others, to walk the straight and narrow that flattens that road and makes the path that enables the deceived to find. Sure, I may veer off the road from time to time, but I will return instantly. I know the difference between hitting and falling over the bumps on the wrong road compared to the commitment of faith to crush the obstacles on the straight and narrow to smooth the road for those who come after me. Love demands the display of the power of God because the love in me will not be satisfied by making excuses for any unrescued casualties. You see... There was this one sheep that strayed away, but love was compelled, and love responded. You see, there was this woman who lost a coin, one coin. She still had nine left, so what's the big deal? It wasn't good enough. That's not kingdom thinking. No, she had a job to do. She lit the lap, she swept the house, and searched, and she didn't stop until she found the lost coin. Luke fifteen eighteen. When Jesus said to seek the kingdom first... He wasn't saying, make sure you get to heaven. No, he was referring to a mindset and a heart commitment. Seek the kingdom and take your decision from the kingdom. Look to the kingdom before you are moved by anything else. Matthew 6.33 Sure, the woman had nine other coins, but she rejoiced when she found the one she lost. Luke 15.10 Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner, just one sinner who repents. You see, I am in a relationship. What matters to the Father matters to me. I need the heart of the Father. I need to yield the Holy Spirit. And I need the love of God to guide me. Then I will seek diligently until I find the lost one. I will contend and see for the one who is blind. I will walk for the one who is lame. I will live for the one who went to sleep before his time. You see, I have the kingdom. I have all good things in abundance. I have sight for the blind, legs for the lame, life for the dead. I found all the provisions of the kingdom, and they are within my reach because I know my Father. I yielded to Holy Spirit. I understand the relationship in God's love compels me. Now I realize who I am. I am nothing within myself. It is the Father in me. He does the works. Jesus wasn't saying seek the kingdom because it's lost somewhere and you need to find it. No, I know where the kingdom is. The kingdom is inside of me because Holy Spirit is inside of me. I seek the kingdom first. I view and see the ways of the kingdom before I am moved by anything in this natural that does not line up with this kingdom. You see, the kingdom is within me, and all the provisions for any call that God has on my life is already in the storehouse. I lay up treasure in heaven because there is an open heaven over me. Anything that is available in heaven is available in the kingdom of God that resides within me. I have peace for the one who is in turmoil. I have rest for the one who is in torment. I have answers to the one who has lost all hope. I have life for the one who is tempted to take his own. I have truth to respond to any devil, this deception. And yes, I have eyes for the blind, I have ears for the deaf, I have legs for the lame and for the poor. I have 
good news of the gospel within myself. I can do nothing. And in closing, it's because the Father is in me. He does the works. Now that's enough. <laughs>